Well, good morning. Can you hear me okay? No, I'm not muted. Okay. <laughs> good. Well, uh, thank you uh, to both uh, Jennifer and Katie for arranging this. Um, uh, I haven't been out to see a lot of building departments, obviously, uh, uh, in the last little while. So I really appreciate it. And actually, uh, I think it's a really good way to, to get out, uh, in, you know, to see a group of people without uh, setting up a bunch of other meetings. So uh, thanks for that. And also thanks to uh, to Paul uh, Chang and uh, Mike Hill. Uh, uh, hopefully they're on here somewhere. So uh, they, they've been work we've been working uh, with them on the stand data, which we're going to talk a little bit about uh, later. So again, uh, I'm Dave Pizzoli. So uh, I, I uh, am the executive officer of the Western Wood Trust Association of Alberta. I'm out of Calgary. My number is uh, 403-279-3385. And my email is there, dave at wwta.ab.ca, as well as uh, our webpage there. So basically what the Western Wood Trust Association of Alberta does is represent the, the wood trust manufacturers uh, in the province of Alberta also part of the Canadian Wood Trust Association. So um, uh, things from doing this to uh, quality control in the, in the trust plants was, is a big uh, uh, part of our, our, what we do. Uh, we do some things with uh, health and safety. We're a certified partner for health and safety, as well as uh, you know, promote uh, the industry and uh, act as, a, as a, a voice for the industry. That's basically what the Western Wood Trust does. And I, I'm the executive officer, but I'm also the only employee, so I do everything. So um, <laughs> uh, we run a pretty tight ship here. So what I'd like to do today is um, uh, kind of four topics. So I'm going to talk a little bit about bracing of trusses. Uh, and uh, we, we uh, rewrote the installation guide so uh, in uh, 2019. So that might be a little bit new to you. I'm going to talk about some upcoming issues with uh, TPIC, which is the Trust Plate Institute of Canada, and how it's uh, related to the, the, the building code. Uh, touch a little bit about uh, supply issues that we're having, and uh, maybe uh, give you some ideas on how we can uh, do that a little smoother. And then finally, uh, touch on the new stand data BCI 19.023, and, and hopefully uh, maybe uh, Mike Hill is uh, uh, is on here too, so he can help me out when we talk about that. So just get going here. So bracing of, uh, of trusses. Oh, I'm just going to change my screen a little bit here so I can see. Um, so basically, when we talk about bracing the trusses, there's two types of bracing we talk about is uh, installation bracing or temporary bracing. So that's the kind of bracing that, that keeps the trusses uh, from falling down uh, during construction. And then the permanent bracing, which is the bracing that is actually critical to making the, the, the trusses uh, work the way they're designed and uh, perform. So we're not going to uh, uh, touch on uh, temporary or installation bracing. Uh, that's more for the builders, but uh, more concentrating on permanent bracing uh, in this presentation. So first of all, I, I just want to uh, let you know that uh, we do have a new uh, trust installation guide that, that we put out in 2019. It's a uh, double-sided uh, eight and a half, or yeah, uh, eight and a half by, or 11 by 17 pages. And it's a lot more detailed than the, the previous guide. Not that there was any uh, bad information in the previous one, but this one is uh, uh, just a, a little bit more detailed, has some extra stuff on it and, uh, hopefully is uh, clearer for builders. So uh, that's the front page and then there's a second page and you can see that the uh, uh, all the diagrams are on there talking about the different bracing and it's a little bit easy to to refer to when you're talking to somebody on site. So so this is uh, the old installation guide that we had in place for probably over 20, 25 years. So um, that's the one that you probably shouldn't be seeing out there on the site anymore. Uh, I think it was uh, when we created that it was printed on a typewriter, so uh, it wasn't very uh, friendly for uh, uh, you know sending to people electronically in that. And like I say, not that the information is really incorrect on there; it's uh, just the new one's clear. So we hope that uh, people use the new one. So 
This handling and installation guide it should be supplied with every truss order. Uh, it's also available on the, the WWTA webpage under the under the builders tab. So if you go to that, uh, you'll see um, uh, that you could actually go print off the, the guide if you need it. <coughs> uh, I'm not going to click on that right now because I, I, I don't want to mess with screwing up the presentation and, and going to a, a web page. But if you go to the the, that uh, builders page, you'll also see there's about a 10 minute video where I basically took the installation guide and I took details off of that and converted it to uh, a video that might be a little bit easier to for builders to understand. And it's got some <clears throat> uh, other pictures and, and that on there too. So if you have somebody that uh, needs a lesson on installing trusses, that's a pretty good short little video to, to go to, to to kind of understand the basics of uh, bracing and uh, and handling of trusses. So I'm going to talk about braces now, but before I do that, I thought I'd just uh, do a quick uh, thing about uh, how a truss works. So basically the whole theory of trusses is to transfer, transform vertical deflection into horizontal uh, horizontal tension and compression through the rigid triangle. And that's why, you know, trusses are all triangles and uh, not uh, squares. And when you do that, every member in the truss and even in any structural member that's under deflection uh, creates uh, uh, forces that are either uh, tension and compression. So tension, of course, is pushing together and com or, uh, pushing together or pulling apart, sorry, and uh, compression is pu pushing together. So typically, even if you have a beam uh, that, that's deflecting, the top is in compression and the bottom is pulling apart in tension. And that's the way a truss works too, where, where the, the top is in, usually under normal loading, the top is in uh, compression and the bottom is pulling apart in tension and the webs are either in, in, uh, in uh, tension or compression and usually in a, in a truss, they alternate. So uh, one web will be in tension, usually in a, in a king post truss like this, the, the, uh, uh, the, or the, the king post is the member going up and down. It's typically in tension and then the webs coming out from it are typically in compression. And uh, those are usually the webs that uh, need to be uh, uh, braced to uh, resist that uh, buckling force. So. Basically, when you you put uh, under compression, um, uh, so pushing on both ends of it, what it'll tend to do is buckle. And the bracing in trusses is uh, the permanent bracing is trusses is typically designed to resist that buckling. So the longer member and the longer and the greater the force, the more uh, tendency it will buckle under compression. And that's what we're trying to brace. So here's a picture here of uh, some top cords uh, and uh, big trusses. I think these were about 80 foot trusses. And you can see that even without any uh, live load on the trusses, the top cords are buckling under compression, just under the weight of the trusses themselves. So uh, uh, typically you won't see this in a house, usually on a farm or an agriculture building where you have quite long span trusses, but you can see that uh, how easy it is to to uh, get those top cords uh, just a little bit into compression and then they snake. And usually who has ever built in it, uh, uh, you know, phones up and says, well, how come these trusses are all snaky like this? Well, it's because the, the top cord is in compression. And you can see here all the little pieces of wood that the, the contractor tried to put in there to, to stop this from happening. But once those top cords start to buckle, there's uh, not much you can do about it except to take the load off of the trusses. Here's another picture of, uh, of a typical, uh, 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 like I said, uh, compression web, where you can see the, the king post on the, the left-hand side and then the compression web coming up. And you can see that there's no bracing installed in these compression webs and they all buckled along the, the, uh, there because uh, they, they basically just pushed together enough until they they blow out one side or the other and they start buckling. So when we talk about permanent bracing, basically I always talk about the three planes of the trusses, the top cord plane, 
the web plane and the, the bottom cord plane. So the top cord bracing is, is usually permanently braced by sheathing, um, or it could be uh, alternatively, it could be uh, braced by purlins or blocking. Uh, typically in residential construction, of course, it will, will be sheathing. But just a couple of things I want to point out, Don. There's a, a picture of uh, uh, on the left hand side of uh, some purlins. Um, uh, uh, creating that uh, uh, bracing, and on the right side is uh, just a system of, uh, of valley trusses. So even when you have a, a system like that, it's important that the, the trusses underneath get sheathed to ensure that that top cord is uh, braced. Another thing I just kind of wanted to point out here is uh, quite often uh, uh, when you have trusses that are usually over 12 feet tall, um, they get designed in a, what we call a piggyback system. So it's basically one triangular truss sitting on top of another truss. And you have to keep in, in mind that that lower truss, even though it's got a flat top, that's still the top cord of the truss and it's going to be in compression. So it's important that uh, purlins are installed there and there's some diagonal bracing to uh, help those purlins do their job. Uh, typically, those purlins are, are, are put on at two feet on sander. Uh, one of the mistakes I see at site quite often is that the builders think that uh, that's just a spacer between the two trusses. So <clears throat> it's not too uncommon to <clears throat> go to especially a residential job where they'll just have one two by four at the end and one in the middle and uh, no purlins in between because they're just thinking that it's providing a spacer. But that, that, that those purlins do uh, uh, restrain the, the top cord in this type of situation. So it's quite important that they uh, get installed uh, either a two foot in center or as per the, the truss drawing. If you are just having uh, diagonals on the top with no sheathing, <coughs> excuse me, it is important that uh, you also install some, uh, di or some uh, diagonal bracing uh, along with those purlins, typically on the bottom side of the, the, the top cord of the truss, uh, typically about every 20 feet or so in between, because you can imagine if you're just relying on all those purlins, if that top cord does start to buckle, it can just break all those purlins, bring all those purlins with it. I remember uh, uh, quite a long time ago, there was a hockey rink out in, uh, I think it was Standard, uh, that was built in the seven it had heavy duty uh, truss joist uh, trusses at eight foot on center with just purlins on it and and the trusses uh, uh, top cords buckled enough that they just sent all the purlins out through the, the gable end of the wall and uh, you know uh, just because there was lack of any diagonals to resist that force. So again here uh, just another picture of, uh, of uh, trusses with the top cord buckling uh, under their own weight. And you can see here, they actually, uh, you know, closer to the gable, they had some uh, extra bracing in there. Those stood out, but but these ones here, once they start to go, they just all start to go. And that's why uh, the, the, those diagonals and, and temporary bracing for that uh, is so important uh, when you're installing long trusses. So going on to web bracing, so again, uh, web bracing is, is typically in the, the compression members. It's generally found on the truss uh, diagram drawings. And it's important too that there's also some diagonal bracing installed if long runs of trusses uh, with uh, web bracing. So here's again a couple pictures, the same pictures that I showed you before where these compression webs never had any bracing. And you can see in this one is a good example of that compression web buckling you can see how much it's, it's bowed out to the side there um, and uh, simply could have been prevented with uh, some continuous lateral bracing. So this web bracing is typically found on the, on the truss design drawings. And here's just a picture, it's not too clear, but I think uh, I, did, I just blew it up here a little bit. So here you can see on, on this truss, how it's typically indicated on the truss design drawings. So the ones I've highlighted in pink here are what we call uh, continuous lateral bracing uh, that go from one web to the other. And if you go down here, it says one lateral brace at half the length of D 
DT and FT. So that's referring to the joint uh, details on here. So this is joint D and this is joint P. So it's got one row of uh, continuous lateral bracing between D and P, and then one here between P and F. Uh, alternatively, if, if you can't use continuous lateral bracing, you may have some other kind of web bracing. Here's an example in yellow here of uh, what we call an eye brace. So it's uh, basically a two by four put on each side of, of the web. And again, it tells you where it is and which web it is between F and N. And then here's another uh, indication here of what we call a T brace, which I'll, I'll go into a little bit later. Um, and it's going from N to H. And again, on the trusted design drawing, it shows you what it is. And it also shows you how to fasten uh, those braces to the webs on the truss design drawing. So it's a little bit complicated. Uh, you know, years ago when all trusses were the same, uh, I mean, you typically just had to deal with continuous lateral bracing. But now when you have houses, especially that have, you know, maybe 100 different site, sets of trusses that the webs don't line up with, uh, you get these situations quite a bit more. And when we talk about continuous lateral bracing, here you see a picture of the continuous lateral bracing. But like I say, if you didn't have any diagonals, it is possible that once those webs start to buckle, they can push that continuous lateral bracing all in one direction. And that's why uh, diagonals are, are important. And here's just a little diagram from the installation. Uh, guide showing two rows of continuous lateral bracing and you want to have some diagonals about every uh, 20 feet or so if there's <clears throat> long runs of trusses and particularly at the at the ends of the runs of trusses. Uh, that that diagonal for the continuous lateral bracing is generally installed in, in one of two ways either on the opposite side of the, the web uh, just one brace uh, at 45 degrees uh, going over uh, three or four trusses uh, on the other side. Or if you want to put the, the brace, diagonal bracings on the same side of the web, here's a, another alternative way to do it. Um, with uh, requires a little bit more wood, uh, uh, but you, you're putting it on the, the same side of the web. It is possible, like, typically continuous lateral bracing, you want to see it uh, lap over one trusses but there are instances where you can actually splice it and, and put another scab over top of the continuous lateral bracing. That's typically done where the, the trusses might be at uh, a greater on center spacing so that you, you don't need as uh, long pieces of lumber. Uh, if, you know, if your trusses are four foot on center and you're trying to lap them uh, one truss space, uh, you end up uh, you know, using a lot longer pieces of lumber. And you want uh, one diagonal pretty much for every continuous lateral brace. So in some cases where you have very long web, you may require two rows of continuous lateral bracing. So in that case, you would need a, a diagonal for uh, basically each row of continuous lateral bracing. And like I said, sometimes those webs don't always line up. So uh, I put in a couple of pictures here. Of, this was quite a while ago, I was, I was called out to a site and said, well, is this uh, continuous lateral bracing sufficient? Because all these webs and these trusses were, were varying. So instead of, it was impossible to put one uh, long two by four there. So the contractor just put uh, one brace between each one. So it's not really serving the purpose. Uh, on the picture on the right here, you can see where they're attempting to do the, the same thing with, uh, with a one by four uh, where the webs don't line up. And, uh, you know, it just doesn't uh, do a very good job. This is, uh, you know, big toenail connection here. And this one's connected in the middle of the air here. So uh, those are cases where if it's impossible to uh, install a continuous ladder bracing, you have to look at an alternative method to brace those webs. Uh, the, the code does say that the continuous ladder bracing could, is a minimum of uh, one by four. Um, and here's another situation of the problem with one by four is that uh, you can bend it a long ways to make the, the bracing go from truss to truss. Typically in Alberta, most uh, builders do, do use a two by four. And this is the downside kind of using a one by four in that uh, if you're uh, stringing it through like a piece of spaghetti, it's not as, uh, uh, not, not as, um, 
uh, resistant to uh, that load. So uh, one by four is okay to be used as long as uh, you know the webs all line up there. You have the same kind, same type of truss. So if you can't uh, continue with lateral bracing, then we typically go into an alternative method of bracing. And, and the, the four common ones are, uh, the, probably the most common is a T-brace and then an I-brace. Sometimes we use a, a scab brace or an L-brace and they're simply adding a, an additional piece of wood. Uh, so when that member's pushing, if you have a, a, a section more like a, uh, you know, a steel flange or something like that, it, it greatly reduces the, the, the probability that, that that web will buckle. So here's just a couple of diagrams. So here you can see what we would call a, a T brace, a scab brace, an I brace, and a, an L brace. Here's just a picture in place of a bunch of trusses that uh, have a bunch of T braces on them that because the webs never lined up. Quite often you get this in a kind of a hip type system of a roof where uh, there's the trusses are stepping down uh, perpendicular to the, the span of the trusses that, and the, the webs don't line up. So you can you can also see the amount of extra that's involved in uh, when you have to brace uh, a lot of key braces like this. Uh, sometimes if it's a very long web, you might get into a, an eye brace, uh, basically just the the you know the bracing that uh, looks like it sounds. <clears throat> Sometimes, not too often in Alberta, we get into situations where a scab brace might be required. So that's just a brace that's uh, scabbed on the side of the joist or the side of the truss, and it it will typically it's applied with uh, nails or screws, um, but that information will also be on the the truss uh, design drawing as well too. From that uh, truss. The drawing we looked at uh, before, uh, same thing. So, so it tells you what the brace is supposed to be, where it's supposed to be. It also talks about the top cord to be sheathed or maximum purlins at 3.76 feet uh, on center and the maximum unbraced bottom cord length of 10 feet, which is, is pretty typical uh, in residential or rigid sealing applied directly. So if, if, if you have a case where you don't have any rigid sealing applied, uh, typically, you will need some uh, bottom cord bracing. And, and here's an example, again, of just some bottom cord bracing. So this is a little video. Let's just see if this works. So it's just kind of a, a cutaway. And then you can see the bottom cord bracing at, at 10 foot on center. And you can also see the diagonals that have to be installed to help to resist that. So again, this might be the situation in a, in a farm building or any kind of building where you don't have rigid applied uh, ceiling. And one of the questions that came up prior to the meeting that uh, Jennifer uh, asked was uh, there was a question about uh, gable bracing. So it is, it is important that uh, the gable uh, be braced to, to transfer the loads basically from the roof sheathing down through that into the, the wall of the truss. <clears throat> and one situation that does come up quite a bit in, in this gable situation that you have to be aware of, but I didn't have a picture of it, is, is the instance where you have a scissor truss. So you um, so basically the bottom cord of the truss isn't at the same location as the, the top of the gable wall. So in that situation, it's really not recommended to provide a sheath uh, scissor uh, gable, either, uh, or no, sorry, it's not recommended to provide a, a sheath gable that goes to the top plate of the truss because the, the ceiling isn't coming in at that location. So it's better either to balloon frame the, the studs up to the, the top or to provide a uh, the sheath uh, uh, gable in the same uh, bottom plane as the scissor truss so that that ceiling goes into the the top of the, um, or into the bottom cord of the truss and the top of the wall, and you don't have that uh, hinge uh, uh, underneath uh, at the top of the wall if the wall is, is uh, you know, basically flat to the, to the other walls. I don't know if that made sense or not. <laughs> so basically in that situation where you have a, a, a scissor truss with a sheath gable, you want to sheath the sheath gable the same configuration as the, 
scissor truss or the studs that go all the way up. So I just want to touch on some, uh, some other installation uh, issues uh, to keep aware of. One is if the trusses are out of plumb. So basically there, there's a limit to the, the depth of the truss over 100, the maximum you want it out of plumb. So uh, up to a maximum of one inch. So that's something you want to keep aware of. And it's also something that the, the temporary sheathing or the temporary bracing, sorry, uh, you know, helps to keep those trusses uh, in plumb. Uh, <clears throat> the picture on the right is, uh, uh, you know, bearing under uh, either girder trusses or beams or things like that. Basically, you know, when we're, we're designing a girder truss, we assume that it's got complete bearing underneath it. It's not just uh, simply sitting uh, on the plate uh, between two studs. Uh, girder trusses, it's important that they're, they're attached properly. Uh, sometimes they're nailed, sometimes they have to be bolted depending on the, the load they're trying to transfer and also how many plies of girder trusses they are. If you have a, 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 you know, a four ply girder truss with all the loads coming from one side, there's the possibility that it has to be bolted. Um, again, that information would be on the, the truss design drawings. Uh, nails installation, of course, just like uh, with uh, uh, four joists or anything, when you're doing hangers, you want to make sure that all the the nails are installed in the hangers. Uh, modified trusses, uh, you know, the, the once it, it seems like every year you get a couple of calls from somebody that uh, goes up in their attic and they think, well, look at all this wasted space. Why don't I make a room out of this? So they just uh, cut, cut some webs out of the trusses. And uh, of course, that's, uh, that's a big no-no. Um, those trusses were, uh, you know, trusses are not really designed for a lot of extra capacity. So um, uh, they're designed to be the, the way they were initially installed. Uh, broken or damaged trusses, uh, you know, anytime, it, you know, it could be damaged uh, through delivery or installation where you see something broken. Um, it's always best for, and, and what we encourage the builders to, to do is uh, always, uh, if they do see some uh, damaged trusses to contact their suppliers, uh, you know, right away to get a repair for it. One of the worst things that uh, happens, and it's always hard to deal with, is uh, the builder will have a break like this and they'll just scab on something themselves or they'll just, uh, you know, kind of come up with their own repair with it. And then, of course, uh, the inspector comes out there and says, well, give me some engineering for that repair. And then somebody has to struggle to find some engineering that actually meets what the, the builder uh, actually applied to that. And sometimes what the builder did just uh, doesn't work and it has to be screwed or it has to be applied on both sides or uh, you know there has to be another member scissored onto it. So always encourage the, them to, uh, you know when they break something or something's broken to get the repair immediately. And uh, you know, so that they can have some, an engineered repair for, uh, of course, when the inspection occurs. Uh, missing plates is a pretty obvious one. Obviously, that's a quality control issue in the plant. So if you're you're looking at a big row of trusses and you see something like this, that's a big no-no. And of course, that would uh, require a repair. Um, you know, there's depending again on the loads and the truss. It, it could be anything from a plywood gusset to actually having to uh, you know, replace that truss uh, would be the worst scenario or, or putting another truss in between it. So again, if a builder's putting their trusses up and they see something like this, much easier to deal with, uh, you know, after, before all the other services are installed and things like that. And, and here's another case when you're looking down a, a set of trusses, when I go out to a job site, I always look down the, the joints and and this kind of stands out with a sore thumb. Somebody put that plate on in the wrong orientation. And, and these plates are very, uh, you know, using the computer software we do now are, are, are very critical that they're put on uh, correctly. The tolerance for putting on a, a metal connector plate is actually uh, one quarter inch uh, out of uh, up or down and, and only five degrees rotation. So. You can see this one here is actually rotated 90 degrees. So the odds of that plate actually doing what it's supposed to be uh, doing it is, uh, is probably very unlikely. 
And uh, it, it's, it's key that the tooth orientation of the plates and how they go into the grain of the wood is, is critical. So um, it's not very often you can see a plate that can be put on the opposite direction. Sometimes with a, a very small square plate uh, on a small truss, you can get away with it, but the orientation of the plates is critical. And of course, uh, like I mentioned before, I can't get enough diagonals. So when I'm out on a job site, I, I want to look up and I almost want to see, uh, you know, not only see the diagonals of the web members, but you want to see the diagonals of the, the bracing, uh, basically what we used to call brace the braces. So uh, here's a, it was a great example. This was the Ronald McDonald house in, in Calgary. The contractor did a great job of uh, bracing, uh, you know, the walls and uh, the trusses. So that's my, uh, my little spiel on bracing. Um, uh, hopefully uh, that was informative to you. Again, if, if you do run into situations, uh, uh, you can uh, feel free to give me a call. <clears throat> the next portion I want to talk about is uh, Alberta Building Code. So this is, uh, there's not too much in the building code that actually refers to trusses, but in, in section nine here, it says, where the ability of trust design to satisfy requirements is demonstrated by analysis, it shall be uh, carried out in accordance with good engineering practices described in TPIC 2011. So this is kind of the place in the building code where it refers to TPIC. And, and a little bit about the TPIC is it's the Trust Plate Institute of Canada, and it's basically the governing body that uh, determines the rules for designing trusses, uh, but now there's also some uh, stuff in there about uh, uh, quality control. And there's a big change in TPIC that's going to be uh, re referenced to in the next building code. So when our new uh, building code comes out, then I think it's supposed to still be sometime this year, it will actually refer to TPIC 2019 which is the latest version of TPIC. And in TPIC 19, uh, it does touch on quality control. And it says all fabricators shall have a recognized, excuse me, quality control program that complies with the requirements of Canadian Wood Trust Association, national quality standard for metal plate connected wood trusses. So it's based, TPIC 2019 is basically saying that manufacturing plants have to have some uh, uh, quality control uh, standard in place at their plant. And uh, it's, it's kind of amazing up to the, this point that no, uh, that was not really a requirement. Obviously, uh, producers of trusses, uh, you know, want to put out a quality program, but it was possible uh, up until this to uh, produce trusses without really having quality program in your plant. So it's something the Western Wood Trusses Association has been working on with our members for quite a while. So uh, our members are, are, uh, are going to be able to meet this standard. And, uh, you know, this is, is a, a typical quality control issue that uh, you want to have a, a, a place in a system in place in your plant to ensure that these things don't happen, uh, like a plate getting missed. Uh, one of the the biggest uh, things that you can do in a quality uh, control uh, system in a truss manufacturing plant is to ensure that there's a plate on both sides of the trusses. So basically what we've introduced in quality control uh, management system from the WWTA is it's really a quality control management system. And, and just briefly to go over it. So we're looking for the, the trust company to have a manual that outlines their policies, uh, that they have regular meetings, that they discuss issues that might be customer issues or, or uh, you know, something that they, they found through their inspections. A big part of it is that they have to do internal inspections of the trusses they produce. And uh, they also have to ensure that they train their people, uh, that they have some systems and procedures in place for handling and storage and delivering the the trusses to make sure that they get to the job site uh, uh, in good shape and that uh, you know the packages are complete. And then uh, a large part of it is an external outside party inspection. So that's where a third party inspector goes 
goes around to the plants and and basically uh, reviews their quality management system and uh, does some in inspections of the trusses themselves. Here's just a, a picture of, uh, of a guided trust plan doing an internal inspection. So basically most trust plans have a, a sheet that they fill out and they're typically doing uh, at least one trust from each uh, set up in their plant every day. And they do things like they, they check the dimension tolerance of the trusses, they check the joints of the trusses to ensure that the, the joints are within tolerance and the plates are with tolerance. And of course they check that the, the lumber is correct and it's the degree and everything like that. So any plant that uh, passes this quality control system, a big, a big portion of it is doing inspections. It's a little bit different doing quality control in a, in a truss plant versus say a, a glue lamb or an eye manufacturing plant because you can't, uh, uh, you know, do destructive testing uh, of the product to ensure that uh, you meet the correct values. So uh, basically it's an inspection process where you rely on the engineering and then uh, you're basically, uh, you know, confirming that the truss was built the way it was engineered. And then uh, once they pass their, uh, their internal inspection, they, they get a certificate with, uh, from the WWTA uh, that'll have a number and expiry date. And uh, they also are allowed to, uh, and they should stamp uh, on the trusses, which uh, plant they are. So WWTA plant uh, 227 uh, structural trust system. So um, we, uh, the trust association, uh, basically like a lumber grade, we allow plants that pass our quality control uh, system to uh, stamp their trusses. Um, so that's another thing that uh, uh, builders as well as building the code officials should really be looking for uh, with the introduction of the, the next building code uh, through that reference to TPIC uh, that they must have a quality assurance system. And uh, like on, uh, on the trust design drawing, of course, there's a big disclaimer on there that the trust plate manufacturer is not responsible for quality control in the manufacturing plant. So that's why it's important that they have, you know, a third party like the WWTA to do their quality control. Because even if, uh, you know, uh, uh, somebody from the plate, uh, plate company that provides the engineering for the trusses seals, uh, uh, a truss design drawing, uh, they always have a disclaimer that they are not responsible for manufacturing. So basically, they're just sealing that the software did its job in designing the trusses, but that's where their responsibility ends. And, and that's why it's so important to have a uh, quality control plan. <clears throat> for the next round of uh, building codes, so for NBC uh, 2025, uh, there will actually be a CSA standard. So it won't always, won't only be referenced in TPIC, but we expect that the 2025 uh, National Building Code will actually reference uh, this uh, standard S349 uh, that talks about uh, having a quality uh, manufacturing component uh, that the, the plant that's producing trusses is certified. So uh, it's kind of in uh, two steps. So the first step in this next building code is the TPIC reference to quality control. And then we expect in 2025 that there will actually be a CSA requirement for uh, quality control in the manufacturing of trusses. And uh, thirdly, I wanna talk about uh, product availability. So uh, this year has been a strange year, uh, of course, and uh, you know, with COVID and uh, you know, nobody saw uh, you know, could predict what's happened. And one of the results of uh, this pandemic is, uh, is that lumber has just uh, gone through the roof to, to record high levels. <clears throat> it has come off in the, you know, in the past week or so, but, um, you know, I think it touched out at about $1,700 a, a board feet. So uh, that was amazing during the pandemic due to a couple of reasons. Uh, one is at the start of the pandemic, uh, nobody thought that there would be that much uh, demand for lumber. So a lot of the primary mills and that uh, actually uh, curtailed production. 
Um, a lot of them had to put in their own COVID measures, which reduced their production. And then uh, particularly in the United States, but in Canada as well, the renovation market uh, just took off. So that uh, really drove the, the price of lumber up. So what that's, uh, uh, what's that, the effect of that on us is that uh, uh, lumber uh, not only has been become expensive, but it's been scarce in, in especially some of the higher grades like uh, machine stress rated lumber, as well as on the engineered wood product side, uh, there have been uh, huge uh, supply uh, issues and uh, people just have been uh, allocated uh, a certain amount of product. Uh, some products just haven't been available and, and our members that, uh, you know, supply a lot of engineered wood products have really had to scramble for the for the last probably nine months uh, uh, trying to get product. And the effect of that on you guys is that uh, sometimes, um, you know, product might be specified and when it comes to uh, supplying the product, there may be av availability issues of certain products. So. Uh, of course, that's that's created a lot of problems, and and uh, uh, and what we kind of did, we actually uh, went through this with the city of Edmonton, uh, actually two years ago. Uh, so it was before this issue uh, kind of came about, and so we tried to come up with some kind of compromise so that if a product had to be substituted, um, you know, that the, you could view it in a couple of ways, either a minor revision or or a major revision, and that um, uh, might depend on, uh, that will of course result in you maybe having to produce a new drawing and, and the builder having to get a new permit as well too. So we kind of came to agreement with the city of Edmonton. I don't know if there's anyone from the city of Edmonton on here, but um, would uh, you know like you to consider this too, uh, if it's something that you're seeing in your places. So. So the, they agreed to accept minor revisions, uh, uh, providing that uh, there would be a revised layout that was accurate on the job site available, uh, that the comp accompanying supplementary documentation identifying the revisions uh, were clear. So if they supplied a, rev a revised drawings where a joist got upgraded to uh, uh, a heavier series of joists or something, that maybe that would be highlighted to make it easier for uh, the inspector and the revision had to be minor in, in nature. So then they would have approval process again. So some of the examples of minor revisions we talked about uh, would be upgrading to a higher strength LVL beam. So from a 1.8 to 2.0 LVL beam, upgrading to a higher strength series of joists, uh, maybe de decreasing the on center spacing of the joists changing a hanger type, changing uh, the labeling on the layout. The, sometimes the problem with, with the layouts is that when uh, these computer programs uh, automatically label stuff, uh, so they'll la label joists A, B, C, D, E, F, and then you make a minor change and all of a sudden the joist that was A becomes B and C and the, it changes the label. And so again, that would have to be uh, indicated on, on the layout where that changed, uh, shifting members to accommodate plumbing or heating, or changing the truss web configuration, which uh, um, you, you know doesn't happen too often. But there there is the case where if maybe a, a grade of MSR was was uh, uh, not available, that uh, they might have to redesign the trusses with the smaller panel points or or something to uh, that might slightly change the web configuration. So we, we kind of uh, basically kind of said a minor revision is something that uh, generally would be something that would uh, improve the strength of the overall system, uh, making it better. So kind of an upgrade. Uh, but changes that were not minor uh, were changes the result of dim dimension revisions. Uh, loads specified, a uh, change in the load path to the foundation, a uh, change in the software supplier. So if they, uh, you know, the first one was done with LP product and they re uh, changed it to trust joist or something like that, 
increasing in the depth of the floor joists, changing barren locations, changing column locations and load transfer points, changes the result in uh, uh, as of a building code requirement. So if they had an old drawing uh, that was done before the current building code, something like that. <clears throat> and uh, it simply wouldn't be acceptable for the supplier to just say, give you a cover letter that maybe was even sealed by an engineer that said they have the right to re replace the product. So these were be kind of what we considered major revisions and would have to, uh, you know, require to go through probably the, the permitting uh, process again. So any major kind of structural change like that uh, is kind of what we saw with uh, um, that would require that. So again, uh, you know, in your own uh, jurisdictions, uh, you've probably been running into this, especially in the in the past year. So this is maybe a guideline that that you could use where. Uh, you know, the builder might not, again, that's up to you, but the builder may not have to go through the whole submission process, especially just if product was not available for uh, supply reasons. I'm just, is there some things in the chat? We had one question in the chat uh, about bracing. Uh, saying sometimes we see a note bracing by building designer. How does this differ? That question was from Zane. Uh, yeah, so basically uh, that, that's a good question. So when when I the bracing that I've been talked about is 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 bracing to make the truss work. So particularly to stop members from buckling. But there's also bracing that uh, keeps the building together you know, to resist uh, loads and resist wind loads or, or, or uh, snow loads or things like that. So that's more building bracing and trust plants don't get into that type of bracing because it's something that needs to be done by the building designer. And typically trust plants don't have all the information uh, to, to actually do that. And it kind of falls outside of their scope of what they're practicing. I guess a good example that we've seen probably, I don't know, it's probably been 10 years when the, the tall wall uh, bracing uh, situation arose where we were getting a lot of tall walls in, in residential construction with a lot of windows in it. And, uh, you know, we, we quickly discovered that uh, those walls, uh, you know, could have a lot of deflection in them. So they required uh, more building bracing. Now, Sometimes that building bracing gets tied into the trusses in the, in the situation of uh, a tall walls, for example, but, but uh, typically, uh, yeah, trust companies don't get into the building bracing. I, I hope that answers the question. That's for me. <laughs> Um, while we're at it here, one of the other questions uh, that uh, came up uh, that Jennifer sent me uh, was uh, something about uh, what we've we've kind of found with uh, the introduction of, uh, of more mid-rise construction that uh, allows us to build, uh, you know, uh, higher than four-story wood frame buildings uh, going up to five and six, and that's becoming more and more common here. So I just want to maybe make a couple of comments on that. Of course, uh, as those buildings gets a little bit taller, one of the, there's two things that you really have to be concerned about. Uh, one is a shrinkage. Um, so most of them are, are of course built with engineered wood products that have very low shrinkage. Um, uh, you know, and, and you know, so you really want to avoid the use of, of dimensional lumber uh, for things like that. And of course, the other concern is that you have much higher accumulation of, uh, of loads being transferred down. So if you're basically putting another two floors of uh, building on top of it, uh, things like that load transfer becomes very important. And a lot of times when you get down to the, the bottom floor, uh, you're, uh, you know, one layer of rim board or, or things like that aren't sufficient anymore. Um, so you need uh, either a thicker type of rim board or, uh, you know, a parallel uh, columns or post or load transfer just because that load accumulation is, is happening quite a bit. 
Um, but one of the other things we, we, uh, we've seen and we've tried to work with the, the home builders about this is uh, when we started getting into these five and six story uh, buildings, um, sometimes you see that, that not the typical uh, commercial contractor is, is building those type of buildings. You've seen more home builders go into building uh, those multifamily units. And there's a bit of a different mentality there when you when you have those type of things. So, and, and there's a lot of issues around who's responsible for what. And uh, you know, sometimes the 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 owner or the contractor, uh, you know, typically they have a structural engineer of record on those types of buildings, which they're not used to dealing with on a on a residential job. So, um, you know, there's sometimes some conflicts between those and who's responsible for what. So uh, we've tried to, uh, you know, uh, make those responsibilities clearer. Uh, sometimes the structural engineer of records uh, say, well, I'm, I don't know what the contractor is going to do here. So I'm going to put off the responsibility. Sometimes the contractor goes to uh, different suppliers and they propose alternatives that might be cheaper in price than what the structural engineer specified. And then the, 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 the contractor goes back to the engineer and says, well, I wanna do it this way because it's cheaper. And the structural engineer says, well, that's not what I specified. So somebody else has to take responsibility for it. So you get into issues like that. So, uh, you know, as trust companies, we are um, not building engineers. Uh, we are component uh, manufacturers, and uh, you know a lot of people try to push our industry into being uh, in the overall engineer of, of the building, and that's just uh, uh, something that that we should avoid. We can always propose alternatives that might be uh, uh, you know more economical to the builder, but um, um, you know, when you have a structural engineer record in there, that they still have to take that responsibility. We have a couple more questions in the chat. One from Bruce Schultz. Other than the increased load, is there any concerns with the fastening of solar panels to roofs? For example, would putting heavy fasteners into the top cords affect the truck? Excellent question. And I, I probably should have put that in the presentation. <laughs> And um, to address that, so going back to TPIC, um, this was a, a question that was brought up and, and there is an actual way that you can design a solar panel ready trusses. Um, but of course that has to be done at the, you know, when the trusses are designed and manufactured. So if, if a builder goes to a truss plant and says, I want to have these trusses designed for, uh, solar panels to be installed on them in the future there are some design requirements that that can be done there one of the things is the actual fastening of the, the solar panels into the trusses so if they're lag screwed or something like that sometimes it requires a you know an, a basically another piece of lumber to be scabbed onto the top plate of the trusses but they can be designed to be solar panel ready um, but where we run into issues is uh, people wanting to put uh, solar panels on existing trusses that they were not designed for. And, and that's very common, so retrofitting solar panels. Now, we actually have a policy on that on the WWTA webpage. So if somebody uh, does have a question on that, you can refer them to that on the WWTA webpage uh, about solar panels. And basically, as a, as a truss manufacturer that designed a truss that was not designed for solar panels, you have to basically assume that it was not designed for solar panels. So if it's a truss that's you know 10 or 15 years old and somebody wants to say, are these trusses capable of uh, uh, supporting solar panels? You know, the, the unfortunate answer is, well, you have to hire an engineer to say that they are because it, uh, they were not designed to support solar panels. And uh, you know you have to look at the way that uh, they're fastened. So roof trusses are typically uh, designed for a uniform load. So sometimes when you attach solar panels, you're 
uh, transferring that load, uniform load to a point load. So if you're attaching your solar panels every foot, every four foot on center, that means every other truss is carrying twice as much load. So that's something that an engineer really has to look at. Now, the engineer might look at it and say, well, in this case, they are capable of doing this, so go ahead. Um, but in, it, 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 it's something that uh, if you phone up a truss plant and say, uh, take a look at these trusses that you supplied 20 years ago, can I put these solar panels on it? Uh, the fortunate answer is probably gonna be, you're gonna have to get an engineer to, uh, to do that determination. Um, the other way you can design for solar panels, and I, I guess this is, uh, goes back to the first way if that you, you know when the trusses are being designed is, is you can simply account for either how they're going to be attached or add some additional uh, dead load as a uniform load. Uh, that's, that might be an acceptable way to do it as well too. That, that's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up. But there is a, our policy uh, uh, on our webpage that you can go see that on. Excellent. We've got a couple more. Uh, Dave Robertson says, non-construction guy here. I was recently looking at new construction with trusses laid out in front of the construction site. Looking closely, I saw some members attached by both gusset plate as well as nails. Is there a reason for this? Uh, so there, there was, uh, uh, I mean, all, all the joints on a prefabricated truss should have a, a metal connector plate on each side of the truss. Uh, in some instances, you may have a non-structural gable truss with cheesing attached to it, um, but but on one side. But typically, those will should still have plates on both sides as well too. So a, a nail connection at a joint of a truss is is usually not acceptable. Unless she just clarified: nailed through the plate. Nail through the plate. <laughs> Um, I, I can't imagine why anyone would be doing that now. If, if we were 20 or 25 years ago, uh, you know, before we had a lot of the technology to manufacture, uh, sometimes plates were nailed on and then pressed with the press, but I haven't seen that for many, many, many years. It might, it might've been a repair. That's the only thing that I could say too. So again, if you know if somebody uh, sees something like that, uh, just take a picture and email it to me, or or you know preferably email it to the the actually supplier of the trusses and and question it. Excellent. Uh, Dale Kelly says truss drawings often include end verticals must be sheathed or have braces as indicated in the max unbraced column of the table below. And he's asking if you can explain that statement. Give that to me again. <laughs> <laughs> End verticals must be sheathed or have braces as indicated in the max unbraced column of the table below. So he says that's something that's written on the trust drawing. I'm not too sure if he's referring to uh, the gable, like a sheathed gable or at the the heel of the trust where you have a, a high heel that has a vertical on it. So again, you know, he could email me or give me a, a call and I'll, I'll try and try and answer that. For sure. And that's what we have so far for questions. Okay, if anybody else. All right. So how are we doing for time? So we're about an hour. So. So the, the, the last part I want to touch on is this uh, new stand data. Uh, I don't know if uh, Mike or Paul are on here. Can you tell, uh, Jennifer? They were, I believe. Let me just find them. Sorry. Hi, Paul here, Dave. Hi, Paul. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. So, you got Mike, so, Mike too there, Jennifer? Yes. Okay. So 
Good morning, Dave. There we go. Thank you. Hi, Mike. So do you, do you want me to just uh, talk about this and then you'll speak up? Or, uh, or do you? Oh, well, you had a spiel on it, go for it. And if anything, we can, uh, if we have questions, we'll deal with it. Okay, well, you can talk about it if you want. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> okay, yeah, no problem. I, I didn't realize I was gonna talk about this Dan data, but uh, I the, the, the good you. news is, <laughs> The good news is, is uh, I, I spent a lot of time and I spent a lot of time with Dave and, and other stakeholders uh, throughout the province, uh, throughout the Western Canada. And of course, um, the other thing that should be noted is we spent a lot of time getting feedback from software developers for proprietary, non-proprietary. Um, we also got uh, input from the professional organizations. And uh, I realized that, um, this stand data hadn't really changed for the since the 90s and uh, Paul kind of tasked me with uh, uh, doing a whole scale um, review of it uh, noting that um, Dave had a, had a lot of input and and we were thankful to work with him and uh, I think it, it came out to the best scenario possible to meet the needs of the industry while following the intent of the code and the professional organizations, along with understanding uh, the design softwares and the proprietary and non-proprietary des design softwares. Um, so, I mean, on that note, I think probably the easiest way to go is just kind of if we have some questions or answers, you know, like, because I like really, I, I think, like, uh, I think it's pretty self explanatory with the detail that was inputted. There's yeah. a question yeah. from Bruce Schultz. Um, should we see specific instructions for roofs made on the ground and craned onto the frame versus installed on top of the walls? Okay, maybe I'll come back to that. We'll just finish on the stand out a little bit. I was, I was going to say, because that's, that's more of a, 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 a a supplier yeah. and uh, design opposed to a building code or stand data, correct? Yeah, I, I just want to say like uh, Mike's right. Like the old stand data, uh, I mean, I remember working on that in the '90s, so it was pretty out of date. And when the the new building code came up, we, you know, Mike kind of said, "Well, should we just change this to reference the current building code?" And you know, we kind of looked at it and said, "Well, you know, there's a lot of things that are in here that are kind of confusing." Things have kind of changed over the years. Um, so, you know, it ended up being uh, probably a year and a half long process of <laughs> Mike working on this thing instead of just changing from the 2014 to the 2019 edition. So, um, uh, I think uh, one of the big things is it, it more accurately reflects, uh, you know, to be used in part nine buildings where the other one, for whatever reason, had this limitation of one or two family. Uh, dwellings uh, so that, so that's one thing and Mike put a lot of work into looking at the software uh, design and software has changed a lot over the years so you can see in here um, it, it, it talks about uh, proprietary versus non-proprietary software and it also refers to uh, you know products that are, are are evaluated with a CCMC evaluation so that's very important. So, so most products that you see in the engineered wood product side, whether they're, you know, trust joist or pink wood or Boise or whoever, have a CCMC evaluation. And in that evaluation has the design values for those products. And, um, you know, and they also provide software uh, to size those products. So it's important that uh, the software does not um, exceed uh, the CCMC evaluations for those products. So uh, that's where it goes a little bit into this proprietary, non-proprietary, because there is software out there that is really more uh, um, uh, intended to be used as a design tool by say structural engineers so that they could actually, uh, you know, play around a little bit with the design properties. Uh, so, yeah, you know, it's important to know the, the software that is being used to design the products um, 
uh, does not exceed those CCMC evaluation uh, reports. So that's one of the big things. The other piece, not to but just about in here really yep. quickly, David, is I just want to bring to the attention that APEGA also developed a software um, requirement for structural engineers uh, in 2004, which we provided the links. And they, in, in 2008, they adjusted the authentication for pre professional works uh, produced by those um, softwares. So that was also another thing that we had to consider when we were evaluating uh, and designing the, the new stand data. Yeah. Yeah, that's a yeah. good point. So, so if you go through there, there there's, uh, you know, I think the definitions are much better for the design drawings. It talks about the software, uh, it talks about the proprietary and the CCMC evaluation, um, and the non proprietary software. It talks about uh, uh, prior to this in the old one, you had to provide a manufacturer's letter. So that's still a requirement, um, but it's a little bit uh, clearer. Here and some of the things in the the old stand data were actually kind of impossible to do for 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 some of these uh, requirements. So it, it's uh, everybody should be able to provide you the manufacturer's corporate letter for the product they're supplying. The manufacturer's installation guide. So in the case of uh, an eye joist, uh, every manufacturer has an installation guide that should be supplied. This stand data, one of the tricky things with this stand data is uh, it covers both uh, like uh, wood trusses that are manufactured in a plant, but it also covers uh, engineered wood products. So, uh, you know, there's a little bit of crossover. So when it comes to this manufacturer's installation guide, that would be that guide that I referred to early in my presentation. It talks about what needs to be on the placement uh, layout diagram. And it talks about the supplier's letter that should go with every job about the location, what products are being used, what the software they're using, and uh, that the designer has uh, has been uh, trained on the use of the software. And then there's there's a bunch of uh, references here to the building code. Again, here are references TPIC uh, 2014. Uh, you know, and the next one will reference TPIC 2019. Um, again, multiple family dwellings. Uh, uh, it goes, and then, but I guess the the real uh, uh, part to, to keep in mind is it is the interpretation on the last page where it kind of sets out uh, three scenarios. Really, the first one is it still allows somebody to uh, you know do a layout by hand or by AutoCAD the old fashioned way using, uh, you know, uh, the manufacturer's, um, uh, you know, properties for the spans of the joists and the beams and things like that. Not done too much anymore. Um, I mean, pretty much everybody now uses a, a software. And the most common scenario is uh, number two, where the placement diagram and design drawings are generated by the proprietary software uh, with the appropriate CCMC evaluations. Uh, talks about the supplier's letter, the design drawings, the placement diagram, and the manufacturer's corporate letter. And then really there's the, the third uh, kind of category that if it, if it doesn't fall within that one or two that uh, you would require, uh, you know, engineering, uh, professional engineering involvement in it. So it's, it's all kind of summed up on the, under that interpretation. I think that this stand that actually uh, reads pretty well and, and probably is less confusing than, than the previous one was. Uh, I did a, a, a quick uh, seminar for all our members. So all our members should be aware of uh, the changes in the stand data and they should be able to supply uh, the manufacturer's letter, the supplier's letter and, and meet all those requirements. Any questions on that or Paul? I don't know if you have anything. No, I'm good. Oh, I actually just did notice that one of the links for the engineering uh, uh, a guideline to the engineering software was broken and it's in the process of being fixed in case oh. anybody tries to link on that, but it's on the APEGA site anyway, but that's been fixed uh, as we speak.
Great okay, job on the good. presentation. Dave. Yeah. Well done. Great Dave. job. Thanks a lot. Okay. So, uh, so uh, I mean, this this just came out in April. Uh, so it's it's the new one. Uh, so I think, uh, like I say, much clearer, uh, easier to understand. And uh, uh, thanks thanks to Mike and uh, Paul and uh, all their group of uh, working through it because I think it really helped. And you know, I guess the question is, why do we really need this? And in, in Alberta, we're a little bit uh, different than maybe some other provinces in that uh, other provinces uh, might not have something like the stand data. And they really have kind of a flawed process where they want engineers to seal everything. And um, the problem is, you know, and, and I'm not an engineer. Um, sometimes I identify as one, if that's okay. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, when, when I was in Saskatchewan doing a, a presentation, then they said, well, they receive, they require sealed, uh, uh, seals on the design drawings. And I asked the, the fellow, well, what do you expect is happening when somebody's sealing that? And when an engineer is sealing a design drawing, all they're basically saying is that the computer worked correctly. They're not taking any responsibility for uh, reviewing it against the, the building drawings to, like I say, review uh, the quality manufacturing to make sure it's installed correctly. And so, you know, it, just rubber stamping a, a seal on a design drawing really doesn't get you anything. I think that this is a far better way um, to put responsibility on the suppliers uh, by having this a requirement like this than uh, just having uh, somebody rubber stamp something like this. Like this, I just put up here, this is kind of the typical uh, disclaimer that might be on a trust drawing. The design is based on only upon parameters sold and for the individual building component, just the trust and not the trust system. So uh, if people thinking that they're getting a seal, somebody is reviewing everything, uh, it, it's simply not happening. They're not even checking that the, the loads are necessarily, uh, uh, you know, correct. So um, th this is, I, I believe, is a better process. And, I, and I, just to support that, I wanted to note that uh, I did go to the, uh, our team did go to the other adjacent properties in the West uh, just to kind of see what processes they were taking and stuff like that. So that was a great point, Dave. Okay, we'll give that. Okay, let me just. So, what was that question again, Jennifer? Maybe I'll touch on it now. Oh, sure about uh, it was specific instructions for roofs made on the ground and craned onto the frame versus installed on top of the wall. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's pretty common here, and and uh, with your requirements, it's uh, very uh, uh, you know an attractive way to do it because you don't have to be working at heights necessarily. Um, but walking on top of the walls, things like that. <clears throat> so the one thing I would say that if they are prefabricating the walls on the trusses, all that uh, permanent bracing should be installed in the module of trusses before it's lifted. And if the trusses is, is uh, sheathed on the ground, that's great because that'll keep the whole module of trusses together. If it's not sheathed, they have to install some permanent uh, uh, bracing to hold that module together uh, while it's lifted up on up uh, uh, onto the roof. Uh, I've had there's been several instances where somebody's tried to do that and they've tried to keep a whole module of trusses uh, held together with just the fascia on the trusses and then they hook a you know a, a crane about it uh, on it and try to lift it up and uh, and that can be a dangerous situation. So. Uh, install all the bracing uh, before you put it up and install the temporary bracing that's uh, uh, talked about in the installation guide uh, before you put it up, uh, particularly if it's not sheathed. Uh, one other thing that's kind of along that point is we did a project with, with the Alberta Home Builders about uh, five years ago about uh, anchorage for fall protection. And uh, I mean, I, I know that's uh, more on the installation side, but they came out uh, and, you know, we, we came out together with a, a good guideline on anchorage for temporary fall protection. Um, if you are working above, you know, the, the required heights and you have to tie off 
the trusses, uh, how best to do that. Basically, it goes back to if you are tying off to a truss, you have to, you know, create some diagonal bracing between a module of at least three trusses to support that anchor. So that uh, bracing guideline is also on our WWTA webpage. Uh, we were seeing just some horrendous things where, where people were tying off into the, you know, the ridge blocking in between the trusses and, and things like that. And they're expecting that to support 1800 pounds of load for fall protection. And, you know, it can probably support 200 pounds of load for fall protection. So again, that's, uh, that's on our webpage and it's also available from the, the Alberta Home Builders Association as well too. Was there any other questions? That is it. We did have a question earlier about, we are recording this, so we will have the video available on our website. Uh, someone was asking if it'd be possible to get a PDF or a copy of the PowerPoint as well, just to yeah, refer I can, to. I can send you a PDF, or if somebody wants to email me, I can send them the PDF. Um, one thing I would like to do, um, if uh, what some of your uh, jurisdictions out there are up for it, um, I mean, you know, this is great to do, but I, one of the ideas I had about four or five years ago was actually provide uh, creating a, an instructional video for inspectors on, on how to do an on-site inspection. So if there's uh, some of you that would be interested in doing a co-op project uh, with us on that, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Basically, you know, what does an inspector look for when he goes out onto the site? Um, you know, there's some kind of, uh, helpful hints we could put in, put in there, you know, uh, you know, maybe you don't necessarily, you know, just, uh, and I'm sure that uh, you inspectors have, have probably found uh, uh, you know, processes that you've, you've done in the past that, uh, you know, what you look for, you know, if, if there's something that really raises a red flag, then you maybe look for a little bit more detail and things like that. So if somebody's interested in doing that, uh, you know, please uh, get in touch and, and uh, we'd like to do that. I've had a, a lot of experience over the past uh, couple of years, we've been creating instructional training uh, videos for our plants on how to do all the different processes in the in the trust plant. So, uh, and create some online training. Uh, so I've, I've got some experience in doing that. And I, I think it would help. And uh, as you guys bring on uh, new, uh, uh, new people and that, I think it would be a helpful uh, a tool for, for training. Uh, uh, new hires and things like that too. So uh, I'd be willing to do that as soon as we can uh, go out and talk to people again, which so hopefully will be soon. I do try to go, uh, you know, in a normal year, I go to pretty much every corner of the province at least once. So uh, if you are interested in the future about having a presentation at your location, uh, you know, uh, feel free to, to contact me and I can also do that as well too in the future. Uh, hopefully I'll be traveling again starting in uh, July, August uh, this year. So uh, just reach out to me and uh, when I'm up in, you know, Grand Prairie or Medicine Hat or Lethbridge or, or whatever, I, I can always uh, do a quick presentation and, and, and nobody feel, uh, you know, afraid to contact me. Uh, always available for your uh, questions or comments. Uh, just got one more question in the chat. Melanie Reed asked, would you comment on trust connections to wall? Uh, so trust kit, so how to connect the trust to the wall? So, so typically here in Alberta, uh, all we require is a nail connection, except in the case of where you may have an uplift uh, scenario where you need a, a mechanical anchor. So that might be a case of uh, if you're in a high wind zone or if you have a large overhang or something like that, uh, you might need uh, some sort of uh, framing anchor. Um, you know, th that's gonna, it could vary regionally, although we did have, a, you know, uh, sometimes uh, if you have, a, th there's so many weird situations where you have a very large overhang or uh, you know, perpendicular overhang that's uh, tying into the trusses, things like a, uh, a, a gas station canopy, 
where there's you know a potential for large uplift loads, you'll need mechanical connections. I don't know if, if that helped. <laughs> I think everybody as well, if you have any follow up questions, you can always reach out to Dave and he's yeah. more than happy to, to answer anything specific offline. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, right on time. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Well, I really appreciate you organizing this and the, I appreciate uh, you guys all taking your time to, to listen to me talk. So thanks a lot.